Today we move on to the other major act requirement, which isn't really applicable in that many cases, but it's important to look at for defining the scope of our homicide laws. And it concerns whether or not uh, something or someone is a human being. Now, for obvious reasons, this doesn't, you know, isn't normally an issue. We looked at a clip earlier this semester where uh, there was an attempted homicide of hobbits. Uh, of course, I said for purposes of that uh, depiction, we should assume hobbits are human beings. Uh, but for the most part, we not a we don't have a, a world uh, with many sentient living creatures, and we treat other non-human animals in a different way. But the issue of the death of fetuses has come up both uh, before Roe v. Wade, as our first case indicates, and then afterwards. And so it's important to see how these fit inside our homicide law. Now, one of the most important things in this unit is to be able to set aside your personal political beliefs about uh, the personhood or non-personhood of unborn fetuses, zygotes, or various uh, points during a pregnancy. Um, and I say this not because, uh, you know, I, I'm saying you can't have strong opinions or you shouldn't have strong opinions on this issue, but one of the most important things a lawyer needs to be able to do from time to time is set aside their uh, personal uh, values and look at the law objectively. And this is true even, or maybe especially, if they are engaged in litigation about an issue they care deeply about um, because the ability to step back and look uh, from different angles uh, will make you far better in your litigation uh, as an advocate um, and for that cause because if you become too interwoven with your beliefs and the certainty that they are right you won't be able to assess them with the same um, skill and with the same ability that hopefully you have uh, developed as a lawyer. So uh, yeah, this, you know, and, and one of the nice things about this pair of cases is you'll see how the first one, which is pre-row, but the majority of dissent, dissent clearly believe that what they are deciding is not just about that case, but about a larger political landscape and the issue of abortion, uh, which although not as, you know, uh, big of a wedge issue uh, in 1970 as it is now, uh, it was still something that these judges of California were clearly conscious of. Uh, whereas the second case shows uh, that, in fact, many of that many of those concerns and worries that both uh, the majority and dissent had in Keeler uh, weren't warranted, that they weren't deciding these bigger issues, and that there was a way to resolve uh, this seeming issue of abortion being legal and homicide being illegal with the status of fetuses in both uh, situations potentially being different. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through it. So we're not going to engage in some larger philosophical debate about what makes a human or what are the characteristics um, that make us uh, um, worthy of protection under homicide laws. This is still just an exercise of statutory interpretation, meaning human being is in the statute. What does that mean? Right? We do not have to look um, into this broader normative or um, ontological uh, uh, perspective of what makes a human being, what should we use to define humanness. We just look at what the statute is and what it should mean using the same tools we've used uh, before. So the first case is the one that's in every crim law book that I know of and is a valuable case just from a statutory interpretation perspective, but also gets to this question of whether or not an unborn fetus can, is considered a human being for purposes of our homicide statute. So the facts in this case, you know, are, are pretty uh, egregious in terms of the targeting by the defendant of um, a pregnant woman uh, and specifically, a, you know, focusing his assault and battery at uh, the uh, unborn fetus. And this is because uh, our defendant had had a long-term relationship uh, with the victim of the assault here, Teresa Keeler. Uh, in fact, a very long time. I mean, this was not a, a brief relationship. And uh, they had had children and, you know, had, had you know, proceeded on with their lives. But now uh, Mrs. Keeler was pregnant by someone else, uh, Ernest Vaughn. And so the defendant, you know, costs uh, Teresa Keeler in the middle of the road by stopping her car from moving, pulls her over. Um, he's quite clear about his intentions here. He says, I hear you're pregnant. If you are, you'd better stay away from the girls and from here. She didn't reply. He opens the car door. And as she testifies, he assisted me out of the car. It wasn't roughly at this time. 
But then he proceeds to look at her abdomen and become extremely upset. And at that point, he even says he's going to stomp the fetus out of her. So his his intent and, and desire here is is absolutely clear. And so I say the facts are egregious. I mean, you know, we know what he's intending, which is very different than the second case where it's not clear the defendant had any knowledge of the pregnancy here. So these are bad facts in terms of the assault on the fetus if the fetus uh, has a status under the homicide statute. But as a side here, it's important to recognize he's always guilty of an assault and battery of some form and degree here uh, of Teresa Keeler, no matter what. The question is, is uh, this uh, homicide charge uh, viable here? Now, there's, you know, the, the statute in California, uh, Section 187, uh, which is often referred to in many rap lyrics over the years, so if you might have heard of it before, um, it murders the unlawful killing of a human being, right? So this is the language we're looking at. And the majority here, you know, uses some of the tools that we look at uh, from a statutory interpretation perspective, but they mostly focus in on sort of a legislative intent. What was the legislature trying to do? But in order to decide that, they actually take a trip back in time because homicide statutes, although amended or um, you know recodified, uh, mostly been unaltered um, for a very long period of time. And so the court here discovers that Section uh, 187 originally came about in the Penal Code of 1872, uh, but that was just a redefining of the Crimes and Punishments Acts of 1850. Um, and those uh, were just a incorporation of the common law uh, that date back, dates back to at least the mid-17th century. Um, so this is quite a journey in terms of deciding the legislature, in this case really the Parliament of England and the common law judges of England, what they meant. And they, they cite uh, Koch, a you know, famous philosopher, writer in this area, um, on this issue. And so this has the effect of, of largely making it clear, you know, if we're going to follow this process, that fetuses cannot count as human beings because they weren't recognized as such uh, during that time. Um, and so if the legislature wanted to include uh, fetuses according to the majority, they would have to make that clear in a subsequent codification or um, you know, any amendment uh, made to the homicide statute. And since they haven't, according to the majority, uh, we must follow what uh, was uh, the law at that time. Um, there's also some discussion under either circumstance, whether it's following the the rule of, of Coke way back in the 17th century, uh, to say the dissenting view, which is we should update the definition based on science, over the issue of viability. Uh, because even if the fetus does get uh, human being status for purposes of the homicide statute, uh, the, it has to be viable uh, for causation uh, to uh, apply in this manner. Because if the fetus was not viable and may not have been born, that's, that presents a, a different problem. Um, but, you know, this far along in a, a pregnancy, um, at least there's a decent chance for survival. It's hard to say if it's beyond a reasonable doubt, um, but there's, you know, reasonable doubt's not just a matter of probabilities as we looked at at the beginning of the course here. And so at the end of the day, the court says, no, no, uh, even though his assault on the fetus may be you know, horrific, and in fact, it's Teresa who feels that injury as well, uh, because she, you know, was pregnant with a child that she wanted to be born, and now uh, that cannot happen, in addition to the assault to her person. And so the court says, no, we have to stick with the law as it once was. But they do, you know, I've edited the opinion down, but even you can sense that the court is really you know, considering this sort of abortion issue as a backdrop. And I think the majority here is worried that if it decides a fetus is a person and a human being for purposes of the homicide statute, that would have the effect of criminalizing abortion. And so I think that guides some of their uh, ruling and reasoning. Uh, whereas the dissent reaches the opposite conclusion, saying that at the 35 week of development, which is the estimated age of the fetus at this point, there's a 96% chance of survival. Now you'll notice something else here, and, and again, I think this is a reason why both opinions deserve criticism, 
is they, they both seem to pick facts that favor their views. In this case, picking the viability range, uh, whereas the majority said it's 75 to 96, according to the expert testimony. Uh, the dissent says, no, no, it's 96. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's both sides are, are, I think, so focused in the politics here that they're losing track of what is and should be a, a statutory interpretation exercise that's not clouded uh, by those uh, larger concerns, potentially. Um, and the dissent says, you know, talking a little bit about this nut concept that you're you're probably not as familiar with the concept of quickening and what it means for a, a child to be quickened. Um, you know, a lot of this is very um, antiquated and itself is, is tough to adapt to modern uh, birthing practices. For example, uh, it's left entirely unsaid by both the majority and dissent, uh, you know, and admittedly the dissent has greater reason to engage us. What happens in the event of a C-section? Right. Is that something that uh, changes the, the birthing process? You know, and, and what, where is the bright line here? And there might not be no, a bright line at all uh, for when a person comes into being and becomes a human being. Um, but the dissent ultimately says, no, no, we shouldn't use the definition from the 17th century. We should use the definition that's reflected by modern science. And I think the dissent's most clever argument and one we need to think about in class is, well, we have changed the meaning or, you know, the end of life expectations here. So, you know, what, where was we thought somebody was dead before, say, when their heart stopped, we now recognize, in fact, that CPR and breath can sometimes revive them. Uh, you know, people who've fallen into frozen lakes have, you know, been thought dead under previous eras now uh, might still be alive and might count as a human being. This argument, I think, is quite clever, might seem persuasive, but maybe there's some problems with it. You'll notice the majority doesn't address it um, on point, and so I think we should. We should look at it in greater detail. But I also want to highlight um, you know, how the politics of these, the, these two opinions also um, create a reversal of politics on another dimension, which is we typically associate conservatives with both being anti-abortion, and focusing on sort of original meaning um, is certainly in the constitutional context, but, you know, it's not a stretch in this context, to say, to statutes as well, meaning that they would tend to want to focus on the original meaning in the 17th century. Uh, but instead, they don't, right? There, there's an anti-abortion opinion that says, no, no, we need to keep updating the meaning of human being based on changing science. Whereas the majority, liberals, are focused on having a right to choose the, uh, to have an abortion and um, typically would say, no, words need to update. We can't just leave them trapped in time. They need to recognize changing circumstances. And yet there's a reversal there as well. And as I said, you know, it's it's okay to be critical of both opinions here, recognizing that, you know, and, and I've tried to edit a lot of it out, but you can still see a lot of politics and fears, you know, seeping in to the subtext, uh, when the simple fact is both opinions are viable statutory interpretations, right? Both of them can look at the phrase human being and reach a different outcome here. And neither is precluded um, by some constitutional doctrine or anything else. This is a matter of discretion. What should the statute mean? And so we can have normative views and we can have interpretive views about what it should mean. But the range of possibility here does include both because human being is not defined in the statute. There's no specific mention of fetuses. And it's left to the courts and potentially jurors uh, to decide what is a human being. And so this case, you know, especially because abortion is such a cultural wedge issue in our country, can sort of feel tense and, and anxious almost reading it and thinking this through. Uh, but that's where I, I, you know, unlike other books, I like to include a modern case here, California v. Taylor, which is well past Roe v. Wade, because it shows that, you know, this didn't, it wasn't such a clear binary choice that I think the majority in dissent thought in uh, the Keeler case, that in fact there were alternatives. Um, so I don't know if this map and how current it is, it was from a news program and I picked it up, but the point of it is to illustrate that many states uh, incorporated um, fetuses into their homicide laws, either as a wholly separate statute or is one that um, uh, was in the homicide statute but included an addendum. So in addition to human beings that have been born, we also will add this category of fetuses. Now, it might be that causing the death of a fetus would be punished less harshly or the same. But either way, because the only issue in Keeler was really one of statute, 
Congress or a state legislature can amend that statute. Um, there's nothing that, that you know prevents that. And so you might say, well, how can this be? How can we have fetal homicide laws and have Roe v. Wade uh, and its you know, progeny, even cases that limit it like Casey, um, how can we have that right to choose it? Well, the answer is we don't need an underlying consistent theory about human beings uh, in con law and crim law. The, the fact that differentiates those two situations is consent and a doctor's care, meaning that a patient who goes in and has a voluntary consensual abortion for which they are get informed consent from the doctor, the doctor is a medical professional who administers this procedure, that is specifically excluded from the fetal homicide laws. In other words, it won't run afoul of Roe v. Wade because Roe v. Wade is only protecting the right to choose. There is no right to choose when it's a homicide, right? When uh, Keeler, uh, the defendant in the first case, uh, intentionally tried to stomp uh, and punch uh, the pregnant woman, Teresa's belly, um, he was uh, not engaging in a agreed to consensual termination of the pregnancy. Uh, similarly, our defendant in Taylor um, is is not you know this is not a medical procedure so you can create a law that both recognizes Roe and um, uh, still punishes uh, the death of a fetus however harshly uh, the state legislature deems appropriate and so this is somewhat of a compromise uh, between what is you know seen as two very polar opposite views. But it's also one that you know many people who are pro-choice um, supported. Not everyone, because we'll talk about some of the complications here in a minute. Um, and that's because the injury to a person and to the fetus is is, is real, whether or not that person's a human being. People, you know, shape their lives around pregnancies and childbirth, and particularly when uh, the pregnancy is far along, they have enormous expectations, they have connections to the fetus. And so whether or not we classify that fetus as a human being, it still can be considered criminal, right? Whether, you know, without that need to make personhood uh, part of the categorization there. And so California v. Taylor um, is a slightly different situation, although we in both, both cases we have um, 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 uh, sort of ex-lovers, and uh, but here we have more ambiguity about uh, whether or not uh, the fetus was was near viability. Well, I think it's quite clear not, um, so I shouldn't say ambiguity. But then whether or not the defendant knows about the pregnancy, because uh, the defendant here is trying to shoot uh, at. Uh, the victim, uh, you know, the police respond. Um, there's a bit, there's a prior history here, right? It's it's not, um, you know, the, there has been a consensual relationship where they dated and lived together, but then there was a subsequent rape, and then the victim had said, "I want," you know, the defendant kept away from me, and so months after this rape, when the defendant enters her apartment, he, he shoots and kills her, and then is chased away uh, by a friend and the victim's son, um, but the. The fetus here is only 11 to 13 weeks, right? Far sooner in the process and, and not um, at all uh, viable outside of the womb. Um, but our defendant is uh, convicted of two counts of second degree murder, right? One uh, for uh, the uh, adult pregnant human victim and one for the fetus. And this is consistent, as I said, with Roe v. Wade, and it allows uh, the government to proceed with both counts and ultimately sentenced to 65 years in uh, prison, which is uh, quite serious. But there is one oddity here, and it does help segue to our next section, which is mens rea, which is a big part of homicide. But you don't need to know the specialized homicide uh, mens rea rules yet. It's enough to know that how can he, to wonder, how can he be guilty of a murder count, which is an intentional or near intentional uh, homicide, uh, if he doesn't know she's pregnant? And this gets back to something I mentioned in our, our second causation case, which is this rule that sometimes called intent follows the bullet. And so the fact that the bullet strikes and kills two targets here, one of which is recognized as a human being and another one which is recognized as a fetus that is covered by the fetal homicide statute, he, the mens rea, mens rea from the first, carries over to the second. And that 
you know, can seem a little strange and maybe unduly harsh, but it doesn't stem from the fetal homicide law, right? That can be the same if the bullet penetrates two people, say, standing in a line, um, and it just happens to be a, a you know, strong enough uh, bullet fired at a rapid enough pace and say it penetrates both people's heads. You would get two counts, and even though you didn't mean to kill the second, the government can charge you for the same mens rea uh, for both charges. So that's that, that controversial aspect in many people's mind is not related to, say, the other part, the fetal homicide issue. Now, as I said, this is an interesting compromise, and it sort of shows how even our, our society that's deeply divided about uh, abortion can find some measure of, of compromise and consensus, but there's, there's, it's not a complete happy ending in terms of how our law is created. Um, and this is something that I, I you know, will deal with more in, in discussing the second discussion question, but stems from the uh, frequency and um, really common nature of uh, miscarriages, particularly if we're going to in, uh, incorporate into our homicide laws fetuses that are this young, right? 11 to 13 weeks is quite young, um, you know, and we can have it well before that as well. And those circumstances, um, a lot of pregnancies end in miscarriage. And, you know, that's just part of the, the natural way of things, that it's not triggered by anything uh, that a, a pregnant person necessarily did at all, right? It's just something that happens, and some people are more prone to them than others. And there has always been a worry, and one of the reasons why many people were reluctant to support these laws, and I mentioned that there was some division among uh, people who identify as pro-choice, is would we start prosecuting people for miscarriages? Because now you have a, a dead fetus who is covered by a homicide statute. Unlike a human being, we can't say it's a suicide, right? And so there's a worry that you're just going to start applying these laws uh, at a minimum uh, to you know, uh, negligent homicide, because maybe if we can find some activity that a uh, pregnant person took, right, something like drinking or going on a roller coaster ride or something that is not healthy. But for the most part, this, is, this was not used very much by prosecutors almost at all. Um, there were some attempts, especially with uh, mothers who were addicts and charging it, but courts generally were, were you know, did not allow prosecutors much latitude in this area. But we have seen an increase in these in the last decade, uh, where uh, some people have been convicted, and their whole defense was this was a miscarriage, and I had nothing to do with it, and the government proceeds and the jury's persuaded. And so these are not cases where there's obvious or even clear evidence that they tried to self-administer an abortion, which is also not included within this because it doesn't include a doctor's care, so that can be punished as fetal homicide, or that they were even negligent or reckless with behavior uh, um, that might have caused a miscarriage. And so there is still a, a very real concern that fetal homicide laws are used to punish people who in, m miscarry or people who engage in activity that, in fact, is, is quite normal but because in hindsight we know that the fetus has is, is now died through a miscarriage, uh, we want to blame someone, and, and blaming uh, the, the pregnant expectant mother has been the outcome. And you know, as our society and the Supreme Court turns, uh, there is worry here that um, this compromise, right, this idea of recognizing Roe v. Wade, but also still punishing the death of a, a fetus in uh, under this larger umbrella of homicide, that that compromise is breaking down. And instead, uh, we are putting um, women under an uh, incredible level of scrutiny uh, because they can be punished for the death of their unborn fetus. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in class. But for now, it's it's I want you to think in statutory terms and see how uh, things change between Keeler and Taylor and how the worries that the judges and justices of, of Keeler might have had um, weren't really borne out in the, the way I think they would have thought and that in fact the law uh, had some, some workarounds to try to address competing uh, concerns in a pluralistic society. So that's it for today. Next time we'll move on to men's rights.